All right, well, uh, uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, now, before we start this session, can I ask you all to do me a big favour and pick up a pen and cross out Defence Capability Plan in the program and write Integrated Investment Program and we'll never speak again of that oversight. Because what we're actually here to do today is to talk about how we make the Defence Integrated Investment Program work and how we deliver the required ADF capability. And given the scale of the ambitions in this Defence White Paper, it's going to be no easy task. And just to provide a little bit of perspective on that, if we have a look at the previous six Defence White Papers, only one of them has been fully funded, and that was the 2000 Defence White Paper. And all of the others, for various reasons, uh, the funding pr uh, profiles that were outlined in those white papers never eventuated. So let's have a look at the one that was fully funded or close enough to it. The 2000 Defence White Paper still isn't finished. 16 years on, we're still waiting for the delivery of some of the major capability announcements that were made in that white paper. The air warfare destroyers are still a year or two away. And the new fighters, the recapitalisation of the air combat program that was announced in the 2000 Defence White Paper, will happen sometime early next decade. So it's been a 20 plus year journey to get from where we started in 2000 to the delivery of that program. And when I say the delivery of that program, it's actually the delivery of about two thirds of it. By my count, there were 27 major announcements in the 2000 Defence White Paper. Eight and a half of them were cancelled or de-scoped. So uh, almost a full third of the program never came to be for one reason or another. And of the ones that uh, have, have come to be, a couple of them ran into some major road bumps along the way and the Tiger Armed Reconnaissance Helicopter, for example, will be replaced early next decade. So you can see that delivering a defence white paper, even if all the resources is that are there, is no easy task. And in terms of the estimates of costs and schedules that were in that white paper, the average time it was going to take, according to the 2000 white paper, to deliver projects was seven and a half years. The actual time is going to be somewhere north of 13 years, and we're still counting. So in terms of the degree of optimism we saw there, e even the resources that were delivered uh, wasn't enough to overcome some of those hurdles. Now, this Defence White Paper has had a much greater effort put into uh, trying to accurately scope the projects that are in it. We've spent millions of dollars on having uh, industry groups come in and do independent costings of what's in the White Paper. I think there's still a question mark there about schedules because one of the things that uh, we've had trouble with in the past has been schedule rather than than costings, so it'll be interesting to see how we go on both of those fronts. I think this white paper's had a much more honest attempt at getting those things right than previous ones, but it's still a big ask, and it's a lot more ambitious. The investment in this white paper, in real terms, is about twice as much as the 2000 white paper. And given the long road that we've had to delivering the 2000 white paper, it sort of sets the scale for the challenge that that are in front of us for this one. And the two biggest projects in Australian defence history are in this white paper as well. Now, thankfully, I don't have to deliver any of this. I just get to sit on the sidelines and make snarky comments. <laughs> and, and the gentlemen sitting on my left here are actually in the hot seat. So let, let me introduce our panel for today. Uh, sitting on my immediate left, we have Mr Kim Gillis, who's the DEPSEC uh, of the newly formed Capability Acquisition and Sustainment Group. And I'd characterise Kim as a gamekeeper turned poacher turned gamekeeper again. And a couple of other cycles. Well, he, yes, he's been poacher a couple of times. Um, but he, he's most immediate recent post uh, jobs were as the general manager for systems in DMO. And while uh, he left DMO and joined Boeing Australia, where he was a uh, managing director there and is now back with Kaz G. So he knows where bodies are buried on both sides of the fence. Um, beside Kim, we have Dr. Alex Zielinski, uh, head of the Defence Science and Technology Group since 2012. Uh, prior to that was a group executive information sciences at CSIRO, 
and before that was in the uh, private sector as the chief executive officer of Seeing Machines, which was a startup from ANU where he was a professor for systems engineering. So it was a very good pedigree for looking at the uh, very demanding technical challenges that this white paper will bring with us. And at the end there, uh, Mr. Kevin Wall is the Vice President for Land Systems at Talos Australia. Um, he's also the Global Business Line Deputy for Armaments and Protected Vehicles. He's, for his sins, he spent 30 years in defence industry, 15 of them at Talos, and the last 10 in senior leadership positions. So we've got a wealth of experience sitting on the panel with us this morning. I'm going to ask each of the panellists just to say a few words of introduction, and then uh, we can put the blowtorch to them and see how they're actually going to deliver this white paper. So I might throw to you first, Kim. Thanks, Andrew. Um, I have to, I've been in this job now for uh, just on six months. Uh, it has been the hardest six months of my working life. Uh, I have now 511 days to deliver uh, the first principles report. Um, I've, sk I've skimped a little bit because I started two months after everybody else in defence started, so the 511 has a 60-day contingency in there for me. Um, but the reality is we have to implement the changes inside the organisation to actually implement the integrated investment plan. So uh, I look at it as though it's a, it's a multi-pronged attack. Uh, we've got the capability life cycle process, uh, and we're, we've now just started that on the 1st of April. We have the smart buyer model, uh, which, will be, which we'll be starting to roll out over the next couple of months. Uh, we have the, the CASG business framework. Uh, so I'm going to rebuild the framework of how the CASG organisation operates and functions. And the last bit is contestability. Uh, a notion that has always been in the defence procurement system, but something we've elevated into, into a, a very significant part of the way we actually run our business. Important part is to get all four of those working, but also all four of those actually linked and, and working together. So that's the challenge I have. And Andrew, I think you've just made my day really pessimistic after hearing what you've just said. So that's it. Alex. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Andrew. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, good morning. And uh, certainly thank uh, Aspie for the opportunity to speak to, and in particular Peter Jennings for the invitation. So I, being a scientist, I've actually got some pr a presentation. <laughs> so I've got a couple of slides, really. And I don't know if they're, they're up yet. People are back. Here we go. Thank you very much. And um, really, about this, uh, the white paper, about, I like the idea of going from paper to reality. So, and I think that when we look at the program in the white paper, that it, while I know Andrew's been a bit pessimistic, even if we discount it, I think there's a substantive new initiatives there around innovation uh, and, and science and technology. So I'm, I'm actually quite optimistic, even if we you know, reduce the, the scope of the ambition, it's still new monies, new programs. And I think that's... Uh, a good welcome news. I, I guess what people really want to hear about today is how we're going to operationalise this or how this is going to come about. Um, I think Kim sort of talked about a little bit about how we're restructuring uh, with the first principles review and one of the big things is that the entire industry innovation interface between CASG, DST, is going to change and uh, we and that is a it's much more integrated. Previously we had a set of independent programs we, that Kim ran and oh, his predecessors ran and I've been running with my predecessors and we've had other programs in defence. Now we really are moving to a, a much more integrated part. And, uh, and it has got two sides to it. There's the Defence Innovation Hub that uh, Kim is really responsible for and which is really draws on the industry and taking the, the higher TRL level uh, results and, and integrating them into our capability plan. I've got responsibility with DST for the Next Generation Technologies Fund. But in there, we have this sort of innovation portal, which we're seeking to do everything in a consistent way. The Department of Industry, Innovation and Science has got some industry policies that they want consistently executed. If you run programs for cooperative research centres, they'd like us to run them in similar ways. If we engage with industry growth centres, please do it in a consistent policy way. So we are trying to work in a whole of government way in this regard, while at the same time also recognising there are people who are more focused at the capability end of delivery, while there are other people at the more you know, invention stage or development stage, such as my own organisation. And, and the whole point of this, but this whole innovation cycle that we want to drive now is totally driven by defence priorities. And uh, in the white paper, there was a 
significant piece of work done around force design. Traditionally, we've done that on a five or ten year basis. Every time we do a white paper, we'll do a refresh of force design, and my organisation provides analysts, and we do some technology foresighting, but now we're going to set that up as a standing capability, and we'll be doing that on a regular basis, providing the analysts to do force design on an ongoing or continuous sort of basis as these capabilities are rolled out progressively, and as well as the technology trends that are emerging, so we can be adaptive in terms of our capability requirements, which will then draw on the Australian innovation system. And you can see the Australian innovation system, we're looking at it in the broadest sense, from academia through to publicly funded research agencies such as CSIRO, small business enterprises, primes, as well as these growth centres. So when I look at the 1.6 billion, if you break it out there, there's a, there's a fair bit of you know, uh, uh, initiatives there that are put together. Today I'm only going to just very quickly focus on the, the top bit, which is what I've got responsibility for. And there's been some discussion. Is this work uh, real? Is it new work? Is it existing work? Well, it's a ca actually, it's a combination of, of both. So there are some new initiatives there as well, and we're, we're supporting. Uh, you heard the Minister talking about ISR, its importance, certainly about integrating new sensor modalities, but particularly the integration of sensor modalities, and we will be strongly driving that. Space capabilities, uh, this is really in the broadest sense. Uh, looking at space situational awareness, in other words, understanding what's up there, and also looking at uh, satellite technologies. We are, uh, DST has now secured a, several launch slots in the next two years with our US partners for CubeSat. So these are very low Earth orbital uh, technologies, and there's Australian capability both in industry and academia on this, and we believe this is a, a technology we should be pushing and exploring. So I'm just sort of pick, picking a few here. Quantum technologies, obviously cyber, uh, cyber quantum computing is a game changer. We're also looking at uh, GPS alternatives uh, through uh, inertial navigation systems, directed energy. And in fact, we've also secured funding uh, for a supercomputer, uh, about $150 million of investment, which will build a system to do advanced modeling on the classified side. So this is really important advancements. And, and this work, I've got to say, is not just for DST, we've got the lead. Some of that money will fund to us. For instance, the supercomputer will obviously own, but other fu uh, funds will actually go out to industry and academia for a partnership model where we actually work together to realise uh, results or for the application of these technologies, which is fundamentally driven by the desire to increase or improve a straight ADF capability. So it's not a, a science experiment. It is actually, we think these are frontier, next generation technologies, which could be game changers and we're there to make sure we can actually push that envelope out to see if we can grasp it and realise those technologies and deliver them for the ADF. Uh, this is at the business model for DST, and uh, we, at the heart, we always support operations and sustained acquisition and, and future-proofing next generation elements. If you look at the white paper, the defence hub, innovation hub, is really about those areas, and we, we will always support Kim and his team in that work. And so we will be part of the innovation hub, but we won't be leading it. We'll be helping sustain activities for industry or acquisition activities. The bits that we'll be leading are sit, sit in, our, in our other roles, which is around strategic res research, partnerships and emerging futures. And I just might just say the model that, that we're pursuing, it's, it's, it's hard to put these things into a, a, a diagram here, but we've tried to do this here. And this is really showing a pipeline model. It, it's one model for the whole organisation that we're seeking. So it'll be the hub will be using the same pipeline model as well as the next generation technologies fund. So some of these things are more closer to the, uh, to the research and so that's why we've got responsibility. You'll see some uh, on that diagram some familiar acronyms like CTD, so technology demonstration programs will exist but they'll exist in this new framework. And the idea is, that, and so will uh, RAPID, but these things are supposed to be in a pipeline. They move from one stage to another and are comprehensively managed with one government system rather than what we had with separate disparate programs and we used to sort of have this valley of death between programs when the technology might be mature from one program but not ready to go into another. On the next generation technology side, I just might point out some of the things that we will support. Uh, defence cooperative research centres, this has been a very successful model. DMTC has been 
quite an outstanding success, but we only have one of those. We expect that we will fund more of these. So uh, areas that we're looking to fund are in autonomous systems or unmanned systems is, uh, is an area that we would seek to set up a CRC, possibly also in the cyber, cyber security area. And that might be a, a more broader one with national security implications as well. There are at least two, and obviously in advanced materials, we're probably looking for another initiative. And we'll be seeking other things, a multidisciplinary university research initiative. This is a US program, but uh, we've got agreement with the US that we can pay for Australian universities to work with US uh, partners in that program. So it'll really draw on international capabilities that we can drive back into our own uh, research. So I won't talk more about that. I'm conscious of the time, so I'll move to the, the next bit. Look, this program uh, is going to be um, announced or the meat on the bone or some of the elements of that program, which will be the, uh, the challenges program, the CRCs that we're looking to set up in the, in the first instance. In other words, the real initiatives, uh, out of that, uh, it, we're flagged, we notionally have a budget, new monies of about 14 to $15 million next year uh, for this innovation program. So we'll be seeking to announce that as part of our partnerships week. Uh, which is where we bring our partners from industry, academia and defence stakeholders in. And as part of that program, we, 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 we had a successful one in Adelaide, Edinburgh last year. This year will be at Fisherman's Bend, our facility there. Uh, and we'll be showing, showcasing our technologies, talking about programs that are under delivery or part of the integrated defence plan. And uh, we will be uh, seeking more uh, uh, outcomes or, or that are uh, based on collaboration and partnership. So that will be in the week of the 6th to 10th of June. All are welcome. We are, you do need to register on our website to, to attend. And this is where we hope our, you know, our minister will be, or, uh, will be launching the uh, S&T Innovation Strategy, which is really what I've just talked about, but really the meat on the bones and some of the first cabs off the rank of that strategy. As well as in that uh, week, we're also very strongly supporting and working with Kim and his organisation on STEM. STEM education initiatives, we really do need more trained uh, science, technology, engineering, mathematicians working in defence. And this is a partnership we're trying to bring in work with uh, both with universities and high schools. So that's a part of that, that partnerships week. So with that, I'm going to probably finish up and say thank you. And uh, thank you, Andrew, for the opportunity. Thanks, Alex. And for an industry perspective, Kevin. Yeah, look, uh, I think industry certainly welcomes the defence white paper. And the, uh, and the integrated uh, investment program, along with the, uh, al along with the uh, industry policy, or the DIPS, as I, uh, as I refer to it. The, uh, I think the important thing is that industry has been recognised as a FIC, and this is important to industry, just how that FIC will operate, and the relevance of that FIC, and how it will operate across the, uh, the capability life cycle will be important to understand, and there will be more discussion about that this afternoon and probably during this session. But I think the, uh, the close relationship between defence and industry has certainly been demonstrated through the, uh, through the industry policy. And I think that's, uh, that's pretty clear that, that government and defence are clear about uh, having sovereign industry capability and local industry capability in Australia. And, and that's important when we together are prosecuting $195 billion of uh, investment in new capabilities in a, in a reasonably short period of time. So that's an important factor for industry. Of course, um, maybe the most insightful thing about the change is the genuine willingness to integrate these three things together and uh, instead of actually um, and well, fusing them together and not, um, and not delivering the strategy in isolated sort of thematic silos as has been in the past or more recent past. So having industry policy, uh, an investment program and of course the strategic view of the white paper looked at together uh, is, is important. It's really important for industry because industry needs to be there to support defence. We need to develop our, uh, our capabilities. We need to develop our products. And most importantly, we need to be listening to defence and understanding what defence need and fostering a greater relationship through innovative ideas like forming CDIC and having uh, industry as a fit will be helpful. I think um, if I look at the industry investment plan, uh, it's very good, it's clear, and it's been spoken about well this morning. I think the DCP, though, in 2000, if I draw us back to 2000, had a lot of detail and information in it, and, and this is the information that will need to flow out to make industry really, really effective to help defence prosecute the, uh, the white paper. 
And, and that is because it steers, in, it steers industry in our investment, in our own R&D money, and it steers us in the programs that we understand that we can add value. I think detail, some detail is important because the consequences of not enough information means that industry slumps itself to making lots of assumptions, and these assumptions often lead to risk, and they certainly more or less invariably lead to cost. So the more we're connected and the more we work together, certainly the more chance we've got of delivering capability on time, on schedule, and on budget, which will be important. I think when I looked at the defense investment uh, uh, program, I certainly did see an element, if I turned it back into the old money and I, I moved it out of the uh, six new capability um, uh, silos, if you like, I looked at it and, and, uh, and put it back into Army, Navy, or sorry, Air, Sea, Land, and Joint. And what I did detect slightly was that in this large program, quite a lot of the land programs are towards the end of the cycle. And uh, some of them, are, they're, they're in, inside the cycle in, in the midterm and near term now, things that have already been approved. But that can be a concern, especially for Army, because if things slip, if, uh, if uh, funding changes, land programs may suffer from that, and therefore they could slip to the right, and that could be not good for, uh, for the balanced structure of the defense force, and then having a balanced structure uh, across defense. So the DCP, I acknowledge, though, uh, has gone. And the uh, defense white paper, or this triarchy of documents, that are extremely informing and informative to, uh, to industry, at least from my, from my perspective, they cover a great deal more than what the DCP did. For example, they cover the money, the real money that's required for the investment in capital equipment, in infrastructure, and in ICT, and workforce. And that's important because that's all intricate in where defense is heading in the next 20 years. Um, I think there needs to be some clear measures of success. I'd like to think that we could document early what the measures of success would be and actually follow those with some detail because I'd like to look back in three years' time and think what are the measures of success of making industry a pick and what have been the measures of success of changing uh, into our six pillars of capability and how has industry added value more so in the whole of the capability cycle for defense. Where have we played an important part and where haven't we played an important part? And of course, all plans are adjustable, as we know, to make sure they're more effective in the future. For example, like my microphone. <laughs> I'll just... um, CASG it has a serious role as a facilitator between now the service headquarters who are now embarking on a much more hands-on role on capability development and CASG will be an important facilitator to drive forward the relationship between industry and, of course, between our, uh, our friends in, uh, in the service headquarters. The thing I think that it will be really important in the early days, we've just been through first principles review and there's some dynamic changes within defense and all of them make sense to me. With the changes now in capability lifecycle and who is managing the capability lifecycle from service headquarters, the Vice Chief of Defence Force Group, and, and other areas within defence that got hands-on on the progressing of, pro, uh, of the process that drives committee decisions within defence. That will be important for industry to understand where that sits, who's in control, who's making decisions. And as an ex-member of the Defence Force, I think the, the, the thing I probably missed the most in the Defence Force of leaving the Defence Force was the corporate directory of finding out who's who and who can I talk to to fix a problem or get information that I need. And industry needs some portal where we can find out what that is. And we need that early and quickly because we expect change will be, uh, in some instances, fairly rapid. But we also, coming from large prime companies, understand that change isn't something that ha happens overnight. And we understand that it's going to take defense some time to change and reformat. Now, if I, t if I take Army uh, from the information I received from my cam yesterday that went to the Lug, Army will drive itself into a new shape of of seven horizontal capability um, managers and uh, two, oh, sorry, a seven vertical and two horizontal. This is important information and of course it was muted. But the real importance for us is understanding, well, how will that map now into CASG and will CASG have to pause and rethink about its own branch 
and spose structure so that it can deliver the capability and communicate better, not just with industry, but also with the capability managers that they're clearly going to have to work closely to. So I think communication is the game for industry. We need to be involved. I mean, the white paper and the in industry policy has clearly opened the door to tell us that we are invited to be more involved in the capability life cycle. This is important. This is where we're at our most value in industry. There's no doubt about that. So sharing of information will be important. And I know that uh, accurate, or as reasonably accurate information as we can get as possible is a real bonus in industry when you're working to chase programs and projects that are large, uh, sometimes even small, but are complex to bring to ground. I don't think we can forget the, uh, the simple things, though. And I think if I, uh, if I draw to a, a close, I think simple things in industry are uh, a well-defined uh, value for money is always going to be important. There's no doubt about that. Um, industry in Australia under this policy of, uh, of investment or this program of investment and this policy for industry, we need to uh, be developing the capabilities of our workforces within, uh, within industry. We need to be investing, as Alex said, in the STEM sector. This is an important sector for industry. In fact, if we don't stay close to the leading edge in STEM, we won't stay close to the, uh, to the investment program at all. So let me just talk about one thing that excited me immensely inside the uh, investment program and, in fact, was more readily mentioned in the, uh, in the uh, policy for industry. It was export. Now, I think an industry that can export is a real great health signal to the buyer. If you can sell your product on the international market when it's made in Australia, designed in Australia, this is a health factor and a health signal to the potential buyer in Australia. And this is important. And that's why I, I really do, on behalf of industry, uh, salute the use of the words that are in the policy. But actually, really, we need to do something about the process to help people export. The process to export is not always as easy as you think. Um, applications for export approvals, they are not fluid. They do not flow fast. And uh, I'm by no means having uh, any slight on any department or any uh, organization. But it is really important to have a more transparent export policy and export permit approval process. Let me explain to you the reason why. Um, UORs require us to react with some agility in industry for exports. And if our, um, if our exporting permit program can't react in the same level of agility as the buyer intends us to act, it won't be useful in the future. The other thing that's really important is we do not want to embarrass the nation by going all the way down a target country's export procurement program and then withdrawing almost at the last minute. Now, often industry falls on its sword because we don't want to say to our potential buying nation that we can't get an export permit. That, that's not the sort of thing that we want to be um, saying to a potential buying and trading nation. So, in conclusion, how will we make this um, not DCP work? <laughs> we will make this work by early engagement with defence and industry, being honest with each other, and making sure that industry doesn't overstate its capabilities or understate its capabilities in the process. We need to build the strong relationships we've had already existing over many, many years and grow these relationships and keep them open, flexible, and honest. We need to make sure that the processes that we use, even the ones that we're not yet sure of in industry that have not yet been communicated, we need to make sure that these processes are agile and they're not, uh, they're not burdened by, um, by unnecessary or difficult process navigation through the department. But we must keep each other honest and informed because my experience tells me that bad news just doesn't get any better with age. Thanks. Th th thanks very much, gentlemen. Um, now, looking at this audience, I'm sure there's going to be lots of questions. So I'm going to use my chairman's privilege and ask each of our uh, guests a question myself before throwing it open to the floor. Um, Kim, you, you've inherited a situation where you've got to implement the first principles review, which is a root and branch overhaul, particularly in, in your shop. And I'm just wondering if, if implementing that 
and getting that bedded in is actually going to slow up the implementation of the white papers program, at least in the first year or two. Um, and for, for Alex, how do we find the sweet spot between innovation, which brings the lure of sort of technically advanced um, you know, qu quantum leaps in, in capability against the um, assurance of delivery um, in cost and schedule? Uh, it tends to be the case in the past where we've chased those high-end capabilities. We've actually ended up waiting longer, paying more, and sometimes even getting less. So how do we find that sweet spot? And my question for Kevin is, um, there, there's a disconnect there I, I detect in some of the things you're saying between industry now being a fundamental input to capability, um, but being given less information to work with. So I'm just wondering how you think that that dialogue between the capability managers and industry has to develop over time. Okay, so Kim. Um, the implementation of first principles, will it, will it cause a delay? Uh, we've, we've factored in the work that there is a lot of new projects that are actually running through the mill. So there is a core of our staff that need to be working with the capability managers, you know, and as my colleague said, the capability manager is going to have a significantly different role. So there is a learning process for each of the capability managers. We've abolished the capability development group. We've now put those staff into each of the services and into the joint into the joint area. So we've got the same people, but distributed into the into the services and into the joint area. So, so is the process going to happen? I think the issue is that could potentially slow us down is just the transition into a new framework of doing business. Now, that's, that's the hardest thing in any transition in any organisation, the difficulty of starting new processes. The thing that the Vice Chief and myself have been really focused on is using the smart buyer concept because one of the things that Defence has done traditionally is that it almost starts off with, let's, let's, let's start a project team, the project team will, will commence its operations, and by the time that it actually gets to a three-star committee, it's, it's developed an acquisition strategy, it's, it's developed a, a, a process, a paperwork that could fill volumes, uh, and, 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 and it's almost an impossibility to start, to, to actually stop that. Now with the gate zero concept, the investment committee will be looking at those projects before they even commence and we're going to do a risk assessment using the Bechtel model, a very large programmatic organisation in the world, that's going to advise us on how to make sure that about 20 or 30 per cent of those projects we can do really simply. We can go from gate zero straight to second pass or gate zero straight to a two minister approval, gate zero to a signature of the prime minister to actually get those things through. So that's one of the processes that's going to have to happen and that's implementing the capability life cycle and with smart buyer. Now, implementing the rest of the first principles, the root and spoke change in my organisation is something that I'm, I've said is the accountability of every one of my leaders. All of my band ones and twos are personally accountable for actually making the change. So we've got a core group of people who are creating the business framework for the organisation, but every SES officer and military band one or, or SES one star or two star is, is accountable for one attribute of a work breakdown structure of how we're going to rebuild the organisation. So I'm saying that's a core part of their business, is that they've got to deliver capability, but they've also got to be responsible for organisational change. And that's normal in any large organisation that you, as an executive, you're accountable for two parts of your business. So, so there's a risk. Uh, we've got to be very careful about making sure that we keep the the business of, of programs and governance working through, at the same time making the reform. That's why it's exciting. Oh, looks. Thanks, Andrew. So, uh, interesting question. So, I probably could, uh, just building on some of the things that uh, Kim just touched on, I think actually being a smart buyer is also being very technologically informed. And uh, that is actually goes into, it's not just a procurement strategy, it's a technology judgment and understanding how you can in integrate technologies, some of which have got low TRL levels. And we, we just, we have no choice but to do this because, um, you know, the region uh, is becoming more capable. They're, they're just strictly relying on a commercial off-the-shelf, military off-the-shelf 
options will not necessarily give us the strategic capability edge. So we must do that. So the question is how do you uh, mitigate that risk? And when I look at successful innovation programs, they haven't been where the scientists have sort of walked off and done something on their own and then just thrown it over the fence and uh, said, now procure it or give industry the, the, the chance to build it. Whenever we've done that and we have have st and when the groups have not worked together, actually we've had um, failures. And when I, when I look at some of the successes we've had in recent times, uh, countering enterprise explosive devices in the Middle East, that was a very close interaction with was the, the DMO of the time, Army, uh, DSTO as we all know then, and uh, the capability, and industry. And we were able to work in very rapid cycles to develop the technology which protected our soldiers, our warfighters. And we were ahead of the curve. So that required people working hand in glove. So it was technology innovation, working closely with the industry at the get-go, rather than saying, how can you build this after the fact, but thinking about how you could build it and design it, and ultimately working with a very nimble, agile acquisition strategy. That worked. Um, I also think of other things like our Jindalee over the horizon radar, JORN. It is the most advanced radar of its type in, in the world. It was based on long-term research, but now what we do is we do spiral development. We work very closely with industry, with our acquisition colleagues and with academia, continually scanning for new technologies that could be integrated. And every few years we try to inject new technologies. We're about to go into the next stage six of innovation for JORN, and it's going to be fantastic. I've got to say, it's actually, the, the next stage of innovations will actually, the way it'll, uh, we're exploiting the powers of computing, but in the sense it's be the equivalent of building more gingerly over the horizon radars without having to build them because we'll be able to process all the data simultaneously. So I think, Andrew, that um, we can actually innovate, but we've got to innovate with the view of a very strong drive from our clients, from the defence capability, but working hand in glove with industry and acquisition agencies and with the end user. Okay, the question on disconnect, um, which I think is the, probably the title. Um, I'm not necessarily uh, saying it's disconnected. I'm just saying that it is being uh, systematically disconnected to reform. It's just normal to unplug the leads and plug them back in, in where, they, where they are supposed to be. Um, I, gu I guess an example that I would give would be um, CDIC sitting in, um, in the Department of Industry, Innovation and Science. Now, that's a good thing. It's a new thing. Um, the, the one question I would have from that, though, is, is that... In by doing that, uh, if, if it's managed properly between two departments, it will be a great success. But the, the, well, the one risk that would form, and that would be, um, does it increase the, uh, the remoteness or complexity of the relationship between industry and defence by potentially the Commonwealth lumping everything that's to do with industry into, into an area into a, to do with a FIC into CDIC and, and actually seeing that as, well, that sits in that department, will that create, promote... Uh, sorry, promote some remoteness of behaviour. Um, that's to be seen, and it's to be guarded against, for sure. Um, and I don't believe it will, because I think the people we've got that are, that are, um, that are leading this forward will make it work. Um, capability managers, I mean, I talked about the fact that it's important for industry to understand early, in any, in any uh, programme or project, what's required, and, and to get a good sounding. So, I think the sooner we, we just stand back, we must let defence reform through the FPR and, and reform with its approach to uh, capability life cycle. Um, I think the more we leave you alone to get this done and set this up quickly as, and get some low-hanging fruit under your belts, um, the more effective we can be with you. Um, if, we, if we interrupt you too early, uh, too much, uh, you may not be able to, uh, to change quick enough. And, um, and we, are, we are the benefactor from you changing quickly in industry because we will certainly be the people that will, uh, will be able to do business better once you've finalised your changes and you've gotten to a level of um, maturity. So it's not that it's disconnected or I foresee disconnection. I foresee a risk in two, in two departments for sure, but I think we can manage that. But I know that we need to disconnect to reconnect and I, I'm just wondering how long that will take. Andrew, I'll, I'll just answer that question in, in respect to the, the CDIC. I'm the co-chair of that. We will have a industry retired CEO, somebody who's really experienced in understanding the industry attributes, and the way we structure the board will be a combination of SME leads, uh, technology leads, uh, people around. So we are constructing it. 
in partnership with the industry division, but it's going to have a strong leadership from the CASG, science and technology, and co-leadership from industry. Okay, thanks, Kim. Um, now we've got some time to take some questions from the floor. We have a team of highly trained interns who will sprint from end to end of this room with microphones as required. I thought I'd kick things off with you. A question building on the Minister's uh, speech this morning. She articulated quite clearly the, the scale of the shipbuilding challenge. Um, it's a national endeavour. One of those key parts of that endeavour are going to be the recruiting um, of the engineers to provide the shipbuilding capability. And certainly in my own country's experience, as we dug ourselves out of the, the valley of death and moved to a continuous shipbuilding program, it was one of the biggest challenges we faced because by stop, stopping building submarines in particular, we had just lost those engineers. Now clearly this endeavor is going to require hundreds if not thousands of engineers. But again, it's an ambitious time scale of cutting steel in, eight, in 18 and 20 for the OPVs and frigates respectively. To what extent is the recruiting of engineers a risk to deliver those programs? And also, what were the implications of not achieving the, the, the recruiting of those engineers? That's one for Kim. Uh, thanks for that. Uh, it, it, obviously, in, in any startup like this, uh, it's how we retain the extent capability we have in country. That's going to be really important. Uh, at, the, at the naval shipbuilding level in Australia, uh, we have some amazing naval architects, engineers. I see a lot of the people I used to work with in, uh, in the shipbuilding industry when I was working in that industry myself are still around uh, they're, and they're, they're growing their capabilities inside the, inside the shipbuilding industry in Australia. I, I had a meeting uh, a couple of months ago uh, where I called all the shipbuilders, uh, systems integrators, production leads in, uh, the Chief of Navy, Navy capability uh, staff, and we had a specific discussion about how do we retain the right skills in Australia to do that. I'm confident that the skills are in Australia. It's about how we program things to ensure that we retain them. Inside my organisation, the recruitment process has already started to actually ramp up. In the submarine space, we're going to have to go to industry to start with that ramp up of support because I can't get the right people at the right time fast enough. But this is this partnership with industry so that we'll be moving through where, where the new submarine program might have uh, a larger number of contractors coming in to help me in the ramp up and a smaller number of public servants and military officers. But over a three to five year period, we'll, we'll invert that as we, as we grow that capability. Um, so there is a risk, but we've got to work with partnership with industry to ensure that we retain the right, the, the right white collar workforce at that engineering skill and also how I grow it. And I'll go back to one of the issues that both my colleagues raised about STEM. And, and I'll give a recognition to Warren King, my predecessor, who was passionate about STEM all the way through, well, as long as I've known him. It's not just the next few years, it's the next 20, 30, 50 years that we've got to start growing those engineers and, and making sure that this national continuous shipbuilding program is executable on an ongoing basis. So combination, how do we work with industry? How do we retain the white collar workers in the, in the shipbuilding industry that we have now? And how do I grow my capability and how do I grow the next capability of, uh, through the, the next generations? Because we, we, some, of those, some of those great naval architects and engineers somewhere in the room are getting closer to retirement. We now have to start that next generation. I'm not referring to you, Spearsy. Uh, yeah, Robert Ason, I'm, I'm Professor of Strategic Studies at Victoria University in Wellington, cr across the ditch. Um, I just had a, there was a very interesting, one of the most interesting charts, and I think it was touched on this in the previous response, was this chart which in the Defence White Paper that said that over the course of the next few years there's going to be a flipping of the percentage of the defence spend uh, on, on, on capital uh, spending and on personnel costs. And in a sense, the personnel costs, 35 or whatever, was going to become was going to be smaller in terms of percent. Capital costs were going to be much more significant. Almost everything I've heard from the panel today suggests to me that the personnel costs of of the cap of the capability spend are going to be really quite extensive. So I guess the question is, how easy will it be to meet that target to flip those numbers so that 
that the larger percentage spent currently on personnel will become the larger percentage spent on capital. Um, I, I'm the capability deliverer, work in a very large organisation. Uh, if the Vice Chief of Defence Force or CDF are here, I'd just palm it straight to them. Um, I'm going to have to give you, I'll have to come back to you with an answer on that one. It's not, not in an area that I'm uh, actually responsible for. But I think it's fair to say that as you move to uh, larger, more expensive, more complex platforms, the manning requirement may not go up, even though the capital expense of the equipment goes up. So uh, th that alone would see that those percentages change. Yeah, probably the explanation. Yeah. This is to Alex, and it's terrific to see you again. It's, uh, it was always great when you turned up in DC, and uh, <laughs> and you had obviously very useful discussions. You had a list of uh, technologies in which you wanted to innovate that you put up there. That looked like Ash Carter's list, and um, I wondered if you could give us a bit of an insight into the the interaction you see with the with the principal ally in this area, given that those are the technologies he wants to introduce into the US system to skip over the replacement cost problems he's got by sticking with simply iterating uh, new developments in existing platforms. Uh, nice to see you again. Welcome back. And uh, so, um, yeah, look, we do obviously talk about technology needs. We do have common platforms. You know, a lot of our platforms are US platforms. So there is uh, cooperation, certainly in the five eyes. And uh, we do look, I mean, the, the strategy is all about leverage, you know, mutual leverage. And uh, if, you know, to give you an example, hypersonics, uh, there's interest in the US, there's, but we have some strategic leads and some very core pits of science that we are leaders in. So that may allow us to establish a joint program that can actually go forward. So, and we would hope that joint program could actually lead to industry capability and we could actually build part of those systems or, you know, uh, in Australia, very similar to the NOLCA program. That would be the sort of idea we'd look at the other the bigger list. But I, su I suppose it's not surprising you end up with similar lists like, you know, cyber, advanced materials, better signature management space, etc. So it's not like we copied their list, but we did actually road test. <laughs> no, no, but in, in the... I've got, to, I've got to tell you, I've got to... <laughs> it is, it is. It is, but it's also actually as part of the white paper, every idea was tested in terms of that it would lead to better uh, ADF capability. But it's also, if you are to be a, a real partner to the US and to, you know, and to the Brits and to the Canadians and New Zealand, is to, is to actually find where areas there's complementarity. And we are trying to focus in on where there is, we get strategic advantage, either from a point of view of creating strategic su surprise or preventing it. So I think it is a, it's a complementary program, but the other important point about, we talked about co collaborating with industry and academia, but it's also about collaborating with the five eyes. And increasingly more so from, previously we used to just share information, now we're actually saying, can you please do that piece of work and we'll do another piece of work. It's a bit like you think about building a car or something, someone's working on the gearbox, others are working on the, on the motor, and you actually exchange those technologies. Thank you for the question. Um. Peter Jennings, a.k.a. my boss. Thank you. Thanks, Sandra. Uh, yes, you couldn't not give me the question, I suppose. Um, I was pleased to hear um, uh, Kevin raise um, the issue of exports, and um, I'm interested to get the panellists' thoughts about what, what might practically be done to lift Australia's performance in that area. Um, th those of us that have been around the business for a while know that there have been a number of past attempts to lift the defence export um, area, which, which haven't really been successful. I, I mean, I wonder if we're now in a different world where it's sort of less exports, more about creating international value chains um, that, that sort of share the, the joy. But what, what would panellists... Um, consider to be the, um, you know, the one thing that should be done that, that might actually improve our performance in that area. Um, and is it time, post the election, say, maybe that we consider a Minister for Defence Export Promotion? Would that be useful uh, as governments think about what the new shape of a ministry should look like? A couple of quick things. And uh, I, I think that the export approval process needs to be streamlined, uh, especially for uh, countries and capabilities that we know are relatively easy. It, it's, it's, it's bureaucratic, it's, single, it's a single strategy, so it, it hasn't got scales 
you can't scale it up and down, so we need to do that. Um, the other thing that we've been talking about internally is how do we actually get our defence attaches and work collaboratively with, and in, we, we have great, great relationships in the United States, great relationships in the UK, but there are a number of other countries out there where that one-to-one that -one relationship is not as clear and Australian industry might be trying to export to those countries. So one of the best, best groups we have out there are the defence attaches. Uh, if you go back 10 years ago, the defence attaché did not think that that was a part of their job. Uh, we're going to start making clear that that is a part of their role to is support uh, through the CASG organisation is that exporting activity. Uh, and the other one is to, is to, be, is to be proactive at, at my level uh, with, my count, with my counterparts, the National Armaments Directors around the world. And I've already started doing that and making, uh, I was talking to my British colleague last night, uh, Frank Kendall, earlier in the week, and I'm starting to push uh, directly with my counterparts what the unique capabilities that we have in Australia that they should be looking at so that they push them down in their organisations. It's really hard, you know, I've, I've done exporting, I've been working in, in companies in Australia to try to export around the world, and it is a really, really tough gig. Uh, but if you can get the defence organisation and especially the acquisition organisation on your side to actually make it happen, that's a really, really positive way to actually make it, make it actually work for you. So, so we are very, very focused on that. And in the white paper, and I know the Minister and the Prime Minister have both pointed at me on a number of occasions saying, Kim, export. What can you do to make these things happen? Uh, we did the, the signing of the Hawkeye. Uh, the first conversation that I had with the, the Defence Minister post that was, Kim, what are you going to do to help Chris Jenkins work out how do we export Hawkeye to a number of countries? Chris and I have already started that dialogue. If I could just add to Kim's answer, I think he's, he's right that uh, I think there's also been not a lack of uh, ambition to export, I think, in some cases. And I think we've got uh, Australia's economy is a bit essentially an SME economy. So, with the SMEs, we've got to think about ways to integrate them into the global supply chains, and I think companies like Lockheed Martin with the Joint Strike Fighter have done that, Boeing have done that, which is great. We've got to keep doing that because that is the way to, to go forward. I think that, right, and they've got the big symbolic platforms such as Hawkeye, etc., could go. But also, Australian government policy has been quite conservative. Um, we, the, the answer was always that easier to say no than yes. And one example is that I've sort of been involved with is John, yeah. Should we export that or make that available? And of course, um, you know, if you said go give away the crown jewels, but the way other partners work is they give away some sell, I should say, a, a version which is far less capable than what you have, and you continually because you're continually developing your own versions, your own versions are ahead, and you export a, a, a less capable version. And the other important point is Australia doesn't have an industry, and I think looking at this is collect, uh, protecting our intellectual property that we export. We're pretty poor on uh, anti-tamper. Uh, we're not that sophisticated in that, and that's one of the things in the white paper where we are investing in a new capability inside my organisation is to create technologies which prevent people to reverse engineer our technology. And that will be quite important, and, and our role will be to support, obviously, in industry with these uh, anti-tamper technologies, which will then support export. Um, now, uh, our defence executive guests have to disappear in a few minutes, so I'll take one last question. Thanks, Chairman. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, Mia MacDonald from the UK. Uh, it is indeed a magnificent uh, uh, white paper, and, and, and I do like the, uh, the conference theme uh, from page to reality. Uh, I might translate that as to actions speak louder than words. And of course, um, coincident with the publication of the white paper was the, the sadly leaked uh, uh, decision, the action um, for the next uh, significant acquisition uh, of the support ships for the Royal Australian Navy, uh, which of course were always going to go offshore uh, uh, the competition uh, was between a South Korean bid and a, uh, uh, a, a, a Spanish bid. Um, but to the points about uh, innovation, to the points about strategic partnerships in, in the region, to the points about uh, relationships with Five Eyes uh, countries, um, 
the decision uh, to, uh, to, to, to go to the Cantabria from, uh, from Spain looks like uh, a decision not to go for the more innovative uh, a, a more modern design that the Koreans were offering, uh, a decision to, to not go to, uh, to a regional partner from a, a modern shipyard and taking six, ship six and seven from off the production line, if you like, a decision not to go uh, to a ship from the same family as, as one of the Five Eyes Nations is, is putting to sea right now in the UK, um, a, a, a decision that sort of starts to, to set the impression that uh, uh, the industry fic in, in shipbuilding uh, and, and establishing a strong relationship with, 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 with Navantia, which I could understand. Um, but there's a, there's a perception out there, as, as, as one looks at actions uh, I, I, against the white paper, uh, that where people might be misperceiving uh, how, uh, how, 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 the, how the white paper is, is being translated. Of course, officials can't talk to the decision. Uh, I understand that, but I wonder if you could comment on, on how, how decisions like that are perceived uh, in the context of the white paper. I think you're correct. Officials can't talk to those discussions, so I'm not going to. I'm not going to. I'm in the middle of a process. Uh, we're in the middle of a government decision process. Um, other than I can say, in the general commentary about shipbuilding, and since I've been in this job, has been very ill-informed, and I'll just leave it at that. Yeah, I, I think I'll take the Tony Jones approach of saying that I'll take that as a comment. Okay. Um, <laughs> So, so I, I think we'll just wrap up this session here, but, but let me make an observation. I've been at ASPE for 10 years now, so I've been watching Australian defence capability and acquisition very closely. Um, and for all of the hiccups, for all of the heartaches, for all of the inefficiencies that we've seen along the way, goodness me, the ADF of 2016 is more capable than the ADF of 2006. It's, it's quite extraordinary when you look at those two years and you look at the platforms and the effects that they can deliver. Um, and I think that speaks for the efforts that have gone on both within governments and within the Defence Department to provide the ADF with, with more capability. And I'm quite sure that as we implement this Defence White Paper, there'll be speed bumps, there'll be heartaches, there'll be inefficiencies, there will be things where we go, how did that happen? But in 2026, the ADF will be much more capable than it is now. And in 2036, it will be capable to the point where we'll barely recognise it in some respects. Um, so I suspect, suspect that whatever happens as we implement this defence white paper, we shouldn't take our eyes off the fact that the ADF is the, the aim of all of this, and that for all of the imperfections in the system, we tend to get things pretty right in terms of the, the large-scale outcomes. And, and I think that the organisations represented here on this stage all have a role in that. So thank you for your time this morning, gentlemen, and I ask you to thank Alex and Kim.